Thank you very much, and thanks very much to the American Libraries Association for having me here today. What I want to talk about today is research that I am currently working on that really goes to the panel discussion title today, which is Second Wave Digital Divide. One of the things that um, I've done in the past is work at the FCC on the National Broadband Plan, where I was uh, in charge of research on broadband adoption and how to get more people online. And a question that's been sort of bugging me over the past year or so is, what does the digital divide mean now in an era where we live uh, in an era of digital abundance, and certainly in an era where there's a strong assumption that everybody is connected? And a question that has, again, sort of addled me is, does the notion of the digital divide, which is about 20 years old, uh, these days obscure more than illuminate in terms of getting policymakers to take action. So let me um, first start out with a few co comments and where we've been and how the, the path we've traveled over the past couple of years in terms of technology access. When I was at the SEC working on the National Broadband Plan, 63% of Americans had broadband at home. That number has gone up to about 72% over the past several years. My friends at the Pew Research Center tell us that 85% of Americans are internet users, whether they have broadband at home, whether they have a smartphone, whether they go to libraries as their principal point of internet access. There's also a category that I think I'm original in developing called advanced internet access. And to me, that is defined as those who have either broadband at home or a smartphone. Smartphones are obviously very useful devices, they have higher and higher speeds, and data show that about 10% of Americans have broad, uh, smartphones only, close to 60% of Americans have smartphones, but about 10% of Americans have smartphones only as their internet access uh, device point. So if you glue those two, the two numbers together, uh, smartphone only and broadband at home, we have about 82% of Americans with advanced online access. Again, much higher than was the case just a half a dozen years ago when we thought about broadband as the principal anchor point for um, connectivity and uh, around 50% had um, access. So when you start to look at the numbers, the digital divide has declined in magnitude by about 40% since 2009, from 83 million adults in 2009 who didn't have broadband access at home to 48 million adults today who don't have any sort of advanced online access. Now, I don't want to shortchange the notion of the digital divide. There are key population segments that we have to pay attention to to increase broadband adoption. So I don't think we set the digital divide completely aside as a concept, but it's clearly diminishing in its overall size. To me, however, the real emerging issue is something I call digital readiness. And I define digital readiness as the capacity for all users to engage with online resources with knowledge about service attributes and use of personal and household data in the various applications we use. And the research that I've been working on tries to put a size on the, um, which portions of the population have low le levels of digital readiness, which segments have so middle of the road levels of dig digital readiness and which have high levels of digital readiness. And the research I'll release in a few weeks shows that overall 29% of Americans, nearly a third of adult Americans, have low levels of digital readiness. This number comes from a national survey um, I conducted about a year ago. 42% of Americans have moderately good levels of digital literacy and then 29% have high levels of digital literacy. Let's focus for a second on people just with advanced online access. That 29% of Americans with low levels of digital literacy does include people without any online access. But when we focus on people with advanced online access, that 82% of Americans who fall into that category, nearly one-fifth or 18% have low levels of digital readiness. So think about it. We have people with all the modern gear, broadband at home, smartphone, a lot of these people have tablet computers, yet 
this 18% have low levels of digital readiness. Among this advanced online access group, 46% have moderately good levels of digital literacy, and 36% have high levels of digital literacy. So what, what does it matter, having low levels of digital literacy versus higher levels of digital literacy? The survey I did about a year ago asked people about several different consequential online activities, and it asked about whether people use the internet in their most recent job search. Among advanced online users with um, low levels of digital literacy, just 10% had used the internet in their most recent job search. Among people with the highest levels of digital literacy, 52%, five times the rate, had used the internet in their most recent job search. Another example is taking a class online. Just 2% of those with advanced online access with low levels of digital literacy or digital readiness uh, had taken a class online compared with 26% of those with high levels of digital readiness with all the access tools that we enjoy. And if any of you like statistics, I can talk about how these associations are robust when you control for um, levels of education, income, and other demographic characteristics. So different levels of digital readiness is a significant factor in explaining people's engagement with many of the online activities we take for, for granted. Just as another data point in terms of the overall magnitude of the size of the problem, um, when you look at people with advanced online access and low levels of digital readiness, that comes to about 33 million adults. That is on par with the total number of Americans who do not use the internet at all, which is 36 million. So not only is the problem real, it's sizable when compared with other key population segments. So let me close by just talking about a fact that we do have significant numbers of Americans with low levels of digital readiness. One, many of the next generations of next generation of information and communication technology applications are public in nature. Governments expect people to be able to transact online and want to encourage them to do that. Um, educators expect people to have online access at home and want to communicate um, about students and, uh, and with parents using those means. That means those entities, government and schools, need to make complementary investment in digital readiness to help the population they serve use the tools that they're pushing at them. Second, Leave the Internet of Things applications that we're only beginning to see, home energy management, telehealth, um, are things that call for high levels of digital skills and high levels of uh, trust in sharing data with others. So what are specific policy steps to help give life to the notion that um, it's in everybody's interest to promote digital readiness? One leverage existing programs that focus on the digital divide to help them pivot to provide resources for digital readiness. This means working with um, BTOP funded programs that have uh, come online over the past four years. It means working with uh, public private partnerships like Comcast Internet Essentials or Everyone On. Secondly, um, develop community tech champions for digital readiness. Um, this would uh, clearly include libraries, which need additional investment to handle what um, is bound to be a new set of needs by users who come to public libraries as they try to wade through this um, brave new world of it, the Internet of Things and high levels of uh, digital trust needed. And finally, um, we have to engage the phil philanthropic community in helping invest to close these gaps, whether they're investing in libraries, which I think is crucially important, or other kinds of programs. So with that, I will conclude Thank and you. turn it over to Rich, you're next.